Okay, thanks, Steve. Um, uh, I'll tell you what I'm going to say, and then I'll try to say it in 40 minutes, and I may jump some parts of the talk accordingly, but people are welcome to have the PowerPoints. Uh, it's a, uh, a theory light uh, introduction to a subject that informs some work that uh, Ben Gidley, Hiranthi Jaiwira, and myself are uh, developing some work on as part of the Future of Cities program. And I guess the point of the talk is twofold. Uh, one argument that we wish to make is that if you want to understand uh, the sorts of mobilities that characterize contemporary migration, the, the sociological imaginary of the nation or the political imaginary of the nation state uh, is inadequate alone and that we might think about uh, the realities of the city but also <coughs> languages of urbanism and understanding city dynamics. Uh, precisely uh, not to displace the national but to think alongside the, the scale of the uh, the nation the scale of, of the urban and for that matter the scale of the, the, the neighborhood and that if that's one point the other point is to try to suggest that um, the the scale and challenge of the mobilities of the 21st century will provide uh, problems that are fundamentally both demographic and ethical for the settlement of, of the city, for the settlement of the future of the city. I would argue that this is one of the, the, the core problems that confronts the future of the city in the 21st century. And unless we can begin to address uh, the ways in which people have allegiance, identity and rights in one part of the world while simultaneously be, being connected to other parts of the world by sentiment, by affect, by loyalty, by kinship, by other networks, then we will not uh, begin to come to terms with the need to build a sustainable city for the 21st century. Those are the two arguments. I'll uh, try and run through this um, along the lines of, the, of the, the, the plan that's on the PowerPoint. I won't get, get, get one at a time through uh, those headings. But I suppose I, I don't want to start up with this uh, populist, slightly extravagantly welcome book in some quarters by uh, journalists for, I think it's Time magazine, Doug Saunders, who are actually Canadian, based in London, Saunders, sorry, um, who has made the, the slightly uh, extravagant claim, I think, that the, the largest migration in history is reshaping our world through the dynamic of migration to, to cities. I won't read you the whole quote that's up there, but this is kind of the opening of the, of the book, which says that the, the, what we'll be remembered for in the 21st century more than anything else, except perhaps the effects of changing climate, is the great and final shift of human population out of rural agricultural life and into, into cities. We will end this century as a wholly urban species. Um, and crudely put, the argument that um, uh, Saunders makes in that book is that the city is what he calls an integration machine, uh, that the dynamics of the city either favourably accommodate migration and migrants or fail to do so. And in order to understand the successful future of cities, we need to understand the effectiveness of uh, the, the integration machine that is the city. Uh, interestingly, a couple of the examples that he gives as more successful, uh, one of the examples he gives as one of the more successful integration machines is uh, the London Borough of Tower Hamlets, of which more in a second. Um, okay, look, in terms of the scale, um, we could blind each other with tables for uh, significant periods of time, but I just want to kind of run through just a, a few kind of background basic bits and pieces of information about the scales of migration for those people who are not uh, familiar with the, the subject area. That, that we have moved from a situation as recently as uh, 1990, uh, <coughs> where uh, the number of migrants was estimated globally at about 155 million, to a situation where worldwide in 2010 the UN Population Division estimates that figure being about 213 million today. Interestingly, if you look at that as a proportion of uh, global population, it hasn't increased quite as significantly as people would um, sometimes, sometimes say. But there is uh, all sorts of problems with defining who is a migrant, who is not a migrant. Do we even use terms like uh, second generation migrant to describe somebody who may be born under a different uh, regime and be a citizen of another country? Is that, is that term analytically accurate or not? We will come back to this. That level of, of increase in migration has provoked, particularly in Europe, I think, a series of debates about national identity or populism. If you open the pages of The Guardian today, you can read uh, about the, the swathes of anti-migration, anti-migrant sentiment that has swept Europe. But 
Obviously, just some of the, the highlights of recent times include the debate that Sarkozy prompted about the relationship between migration and French identity. Gordon Brown's curious, uh, we could spend time talking about it another day maybe, uh, but his kind of curiously Scottish debate about British identity. But also in Germany, uh, the scholars Jürgen Hebenbass and Ulrich Beck have tried to promote a debate about the possibility of a European identity, a sentimental um, attachment based on a cosmopolitan vision of what Europe might be. Um, in contrast to the events of recent weeks, which we'll come back to briefly in a second as well, where Thilo Sarrazin's book, uh, that Germany is doing away with itself, has kind of produced Angela Merkel's reaction, which of which I'll say more. So, in a sense, I suppose what is at stake is what, a notion of what is happening to the post-Westphalian world, how migration affects how states think about themselves. For uh, Merkel, the multicultural approach has failed, utterly failed. Uh, I'm not, just as a signal of warning to this talk today, is not going to be about some subjects of important academic debate and relevance. It's not going to be a debate about multiculturalism. It's not going to be uh, addressing a lot of the debates about transnationalism recognizing I've written about both those things in other pieces of work that I've done, but recognizing they are important, but it's not the core of what I want to kind of think through today. It is interesting, though, that uh, Merkel's uh, own position prompts a reaction from uh, Johannes Rickart that uh, it's not in itself a bad thing that Merkel declared the failure of multiculturalism, which after all is an ideology which places emphasis on the difference of people rather than what they have in common. As it happens, I think that probably misrepresents the nature of the multicultural, which I think, as Stuart Hall says, is a problem of ethics as well as a problem of demography. And, but the, it is a, a, a diversion to some of the things we want to try and tease out. Um, it is also the case that you, when you look at those big figures around um, international uh, migration, it obscures uh, some of the core dynamics at the heart of mobilities particularly in the megacities, the emergent megacities of the South, where uh, McKinsey have actually kind of put a, established a bit of a market for uh, capturing in two voluminous and interesting, I think limited in some ways, but uh, interesting pieces of work on the future of cities in India and China, respectively, have kind of brought together a collection of academics, paid them, I think, um, uh, at... Actually, I'm we're on tape, aren't we? I'll be more diplomatic. Um, the, the, um, <laughs> McKinsey's have done some important work um, around the uh, emergent uh, future of cities in the, the South. And in these two pieces of work, which actually are of value, I would say again, on tape or off, uh, that uh, suggests that by 2030, uh, 68 cities will be emerge in India with a population of more than a million. I won't go through all the facts. Uh, in China, a similar piece of work that was done, these kind of two major volumes, uh, you're looking at 225 cities in China by 2025 that will have populations of uh, a million, and by 2030, one billion people in China living in cities. Now, we can contest whether or not the scale of migration from the countryside to the city in uh, China or India is... Uh, of the same analytical category as international migration or not, I would argue that many of the challenges would suggest that fundamentally the problems are precisely the same. Uh, they're precisely the same because they begin to bring to the foreground how people think about their right to belong in a space where they arrive. Uh, how, they, how the uh, cities themselves choose to organize their uh, governments, their ways of rationing welfare states, allowing access to the city, allowing access to stay in the city, allowing access to, to uh, the labor markets through which uh, migration dynamics uh, are driven. But how, you might ask, this is a, a, a Dagome a, a worker, in factory worker in um, uh, one of the villages in the city just outside Shenzhen, how might we find a vocabulary to capture the lives of these two characters? One. Uh, across the world in contemporary China. Another uh, young man, um, Tanvir Ali, I think this chap is. Anyway, someone, both of which, both these characters featured in research of which I've been involved, but uh, this young man, uh, born in Bangladesh, technically a migrant, but grown up in Cable Street in the east end of London. So if we're thinking about how we try to capture even the very languages of who is a migrant and who is not. I won't run through all of this. When you're defining uh, 
uh, in just to take one example, the Chinese case about who is or who is not a, 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 a migrant, uh, there are many different definitions frequently kind of translated into the notion of the, the floating population, uh, but that relate specifically to the historical legacy in, chi in China from the, uh, the communist period where people had rights of citizenship, the hukou, that either allowed them to settle in the city or, or not. What that means is that with the dynamics of this new billion, this new urban billion emerging in China, there are legacies, increasingly complex but increasingly relaxed legacies, about how citizenship rights relate to the city, uh, to the floating population. Where the migrant population, again, just to give you some sense, in, in Beijing, these are official uh, China government stats, so they need to be uh, treated with a degree of caution, but where you're talking about 3.6 million migrants in, in Beijing, 4.9 in uh, Shanghai, 4.3 in Jiangsu, 6.4 in Zhejiang, relatively small in Henan. But the kind of scale where the, the, the definition, definitional difference between who is a migrant and who is a citizen uh, kind of challenges um, the, the, the very fundamental fabric of the, of the, the city, if you like. What um, we can say in the UK context, which I'll be referring to later, is that there has been a, one of the more major upturns of uh, net inward migration over um, the last uh, well, basically, the, what the economists sometimes call the, the nice, the nice decade, the uh, no inflation, continuous expansion decade, that um, saw an upturn in the early 1990s uh, through to the, the, the 2000s up to the, the, the meltdown of the financial the financial system, uh, an increase in migrant population unseen in the UK at any other time uh, in the 20th century beyond the the, uh, the big. Commonwealth migration of the post-war era. Um, it took place though simultaneously, just to state the blindingly obvious, where the number of Brits abroad was simultaneously uh, also grew. Uh, the, uh, the both retirement-based uh, uh, British communities abroad, but also uh, people working abroad who sustained their British citizenship whilst uh, being caught up in the various elements of the global economy. This is not in any of these flows a one-way a, a one street. Okay, so conceptually what um, we, we might think about then is that in analytical and social policy terms uh, there is a, a general sense that uh, nation states might uh, integrate migrants into their settlement countries uh, in order to progress the, if like, the development of the good society, the development of the, the harmonious society in various, in, in various ways. And if you look at levels like um, uh, European policy making, you will find a series of initiatives around, for example, a pr program that's known as the European Integration Fund that tries to look at the, the methods through which European nation states integrate migrants. There is a discourse in the academy and in forms of city government, in local government, in forms of national government, about how the problem of integrating migrants might work. In the wake of the, the, the bombing of 7-7 uh, in, in London, um, Tony Blair set up a commission on integration and cohesion, which Steve uh, mentioned at the beginning I was uh, a member of. And we were asked to try and think through this problematic of how you might uh, define and understand the integration of uh, uh, migrants or the integration of communities more generally in, in the 21st century in the wake of uh, what had happened uh, when four uh, individuals, British-born individuals, chose to blow themselves up on the transport network of, of London. It's a political process in it itself, the, the kind of generation of those sorts of public commission, but we spent a year and a bit going around the country, taking evidence, looking at the situation, producing our report, as people do. And for what it's worth, this was the definition that we came up with uh, as uh, uh, a notion of an integrated community, which emphasised, I won't go through every single bullet point there, but it did emphasise the contribution of different individuals, a sense of individual rights and responsibilities a sense of opportunities, equal opportunities, uh, levels of trust, which we'll come back to in a second, uh, the notion of contribution from the, both those who have newly, newly arrived and those who have already had deep attachments, and uh, relationships between people and different, of different backgrounds being positive. 
uh, kind of, you might say, motherhood and apple pie in some ways. What we avoided, and I mean, this is where we hopefully begin to move into the um, analytical substance of what, what I want to say a little bit more. What we avoided was two uh, analytical ch chimera that we thought were um, uh, distracting in some ways. One was a debate about uh, geographical segregation of one community from another. The notion that this, the, this concept of integrating mi uh, migration could be traced or measured by uh, the surrogate of uh, residential dissimilarity between different uh, demographic groups was something that has, again, a long intellectual and academic tradition that is entirely respectable, that I wouldn't want to denigrate, but one that we did not see as, as being uh, sufficient alone to, to conceptualise the notion of integration. I'll come back to that in conversation if people are interested. Also, um, for reasons that I'm not going to go into, also we decided that we weren't going to have a big uh, discussion about the relationship between integration and the beginning, middle, end of multiculturalism in the in the United Kingdom, um, and the reasons for that are also complicated. But happy to outline what we did do, though, which I want to kind of tease out a little bit more is is try to um, develop principles of integration, and I just want to suggest that some of these thematics might provide the basis for a register of thinking that is important to the future of cities, but is also a, a way into the slightly uh, joyful debates of the integration machine that we saw in that book, Arrival City, that, that set up an analytical project that might make us think how we can conceptualize, if you like, the kind of scale hopping uh, understanding of the mobilities of migration alongside uh, the, the continent, the nation state, and the, the, the emergent city. And I suppose the principles that we, we wanted to develop was, first of all, a, a notion that actually we pinched from Belfast, but um, a notion of uh, shared future, a, a notion that actually developed uh, a sense of becoming over a sense of being, uh, that what we might be tomorrow uh, may relate to where we are today, but have something that is... Um, if you like, a trajectory and uh, a, a future that is shared that recognises a past that is diverse between different people, if you like. The second principle was that um, we tried to argue that the, the classic uh, analytical understandings of citizenship should work not merely at the, the national level, but should be thought through at the, a plurality of geographical scales. For those of you, again, looking, listening to the radio this morning, seeing the Californian court settlement that allows um, irregular migration, migrants access to state education in California as of today, will know that the kind of, the, the variegated pattern of legal judgment of access to resources of citizenship rights, if you like, can in some ways pluralize the notion of citizenship beyond the level of the nation, the nation of the notion of the nation state. Um, some of the, the genealogies of these terms I could touch on, but people may want to pick up again in discussion. We tried to highlight the notion of an ethics of hospitality um, that in particular recognised the importance of the, the stranger in defining how the dynamics of social change might work in the city. And also what we described as a sense of visible social justice. One of the things that was quite transparent in the, the, the British case and, um, was that if you go up and down the UK, there is extraordinary diversity in both the patterns of settlement of migrant groups over the last 40 to 50 years, both the, the, if you like, the Windrush generation of the 1948 expansions, the new settlements of the upturn of the recent decade. And the, what was very clear was not just the fact that uh, economic prosperity and economic downturn sub-regionally made enormous differences in the kind of settlement of uh, the demography of migration, but also the, the, the ways in which uh, the basic uh, engines of government and the state, of allocation of resources, of allocation of housing, education, health, uh, of allocation of regeneration monies, of the transparency of the legal process. All of this equally varied enormously from one city to another in the, in the UK. And what was, um, if you like, substantively in our report, we tried to argue, was it was not, uh, crudely put, 
that the um, the delivery of the good society, the just the just society, that was uh, the sole arbiter of effective integration, but the transparency of processes of, of deliberation themselves. Something that again I want to just come back to a little, a little bit. Now it, it is the case, as I say, that that that, that it is frequently thought through at the level of the nation that integration might work uh, in ways where we can measure one country against another. There's, there's an index known as the MIPEX index, which is a valuable tool. There's a new one about to come out in about three, three, four months, three, four months' time, which tries to measure integration of migrants into labour markets, access to national identity. And you get maps like this, or like this, with labour market access and so you can see, interestingly, probably for the people in the room, Canada is always kind of highlighted as the kind of exemplar of uh, uh, good practice, which we, again, might want to talk. So you have kind of a Europe mapped out alongside this image of Canada as the, something, the, des the desired state, I guess. But the, um, the, the point I'd want to make, again, very quickly in signaling this sort of analysis is that it's helpful. I mean, it does show some of the regimes of sovereign powers working within a European uh, polis that is increasingly uh, moving towards standardizing many of these forms of migrant integration. But there are problems with it. I mean, very straightforward problems, and many of these people in the room will be well aware of that some of them are analytical, some of them are practical, that, that the, it ignores the reality of transnational diasporic links. It ignores the, the, the ways in which flows of people, capital and so on, are not confined to sovereign states. And uh, likewise, the ways in which um, <coughs> some uh, forms of regulation uh, apply at the level of the continent, the Schengen uh, powers and so on, some at the level of the nation. So exactly what works at the level of the national and importantly, what works at the level of the subnational is then is th thus disguised. But equally, what, what, it, what it ignores is the, the ways in which we might think about the welfare externalities of migration. And by that, I mean very crudely, there is plenty of academic uh, analysis on this, that if you think about the welfare, uh, the economics of the welfare economics of the externalities of, of migration. We know that costs accrue and benefits accrue at differing geographical scales. Very crudely put, uh, there is plenty of, of documentary and analytical evidence that would say that the the, the, the costs, the welfare costs of migration, uh, apply uh, obviously through the, the mechanisms by which people settle and put pressure on uh, resources at, at, the, at the level of the local. The, the benefits of migration tend to be economic and frequently translated uh, nationally or certainly at the level of the geographical scale of labour markets that may be different from the costs of the, uh, what that, the, the, the cost of the migration itself. Very crudely put, um, those areas that might come under pressure in health, in uh, various forms of friction between different communities, in various forms of pressure on scarce resources, will not necessarily be the same, the self-same uh, parts of a city that are benefiting from the, the flows of migration itself. The temporalities and spatialities of, of the migrations of the 21st century also, if you like, challenge that kind of national thinking. If, you're, if you look at the life histories of migrants of the 21st century, whether you're talking about that case in China where somebody moving to the cities in China will talk about Hui Jia, hometown, and, and a sense of coming back and forth between home and, and the area of, of settlement. Uh, the, the, the way we conceptualise settling in a country as a migrant uh, might imply something very different in 2010, let alone in 20 or 30 years time, where we may choose to live in one place for a period of time, retire somewhere else. Uh, the, the presence of the Brits abroad, if you like, is just kind of one version, one version of that. And, si <laughs> and similarly, uh, what that, that uh, sort of national analysis does is it kind of obscures the, some of the, those major uh, rural urban flows, as I say, particularly in the cities of the north, but also, and I suppose most importantly for what I want to kind of develop over the final 15 minutes of, of what I'm going to say, it, it actually disguises patterns of city transformation itself. The core of what, what I want to argue in the rest of the, the talk, if you like, is that the, the very fact that people arrive in a place, in a city, 
m immediately means they become tangled up in the, the material practices of the regulation, government control uh, of the city itself. They become tied up in the labour markets. They become tied up in the forms of residential settlement through which they find somewhere to, to, to live. Which means that uh, the, the, the dynamics of migration and the dynamics of city change become hybridized, become folded one inside, one inside another. So what that means, if we're thinking about those principles again in the context of, of the city, what we actually find, I'm going to jump that one actually. Yeah, because I, mean, I might just, what we find is that whilst th th there are, I don't think you'll be able to see that, I think it's a rubbish, sorry, I put that slide in late today. It was just making the point that um, when we're looking at welfare externalities, we're looking at the pressures of, uh, that migrants might uh, generate in a situation where welfare state regimes are you know, clearly markedly different between sovereign nation states, but also within sovereign, sovereign nation states, both in terms of the scale of, of welfare settlement, but also the processes of welfare settlement that may differentiate between somebody from one city and somebody from another. The point I, I'd, I'd want to kind of develop a little bit, and some examples for you in the last 15 minutes of what I've got to say, though, is that, that conventionally, in most forms of philosophical inquiry, a language of, of rights that emphasises uh, forms of uh, sovereignty, forms of citizenship, forms of access uh, to or freedom from con certain kinds of control or powers, uh, develops a certain philosophical tradition, speaks to a, a deep tradition of normative political theory and contemporary political um, thought at the moment. It actually is, is different from, philosophically, the sorts of languages of belonging, identity, association, which speak to, philosophically, a more communitarian uh, agenda, uh, a, a, a debate about identity, a debate about the politics of recognition, if you like. And that integration tries, in some ways, in most of the social policy models, to try and conflate these two different things. Now, that may or may not be problematic. We'll come back to it in, in just a second. But I, if we just tease these things out a little bit, the, the languages of rights and migration, if you're thinking about the language of mi rights at a very, very basic level, there is a paradox to migrant rights. There is a, a sense that many of the fights around migrant rights emerge from a desire, if you like, to be invisible in the city. And being invisible in the city is something I want to come back to in just a second. That if you, if you think about the wish to be treated in the same fashion, and migrant communities, whether you're talking about the floating population in Shanghai or uh, the British Bangladeshi population in the east end of London, you will find frequently campaigns about people being treated differentially by the police, by certain employers. By now, and those campaigns for certain rights are premised on a notion of making the status of the migrant invisible within the machine of the city. They differ quite straightforwardly from the sorts of politics of recognition that might recognise cultural rights, religious rights, uh, particular forms of educational need that actually push for the rights of the migrant to be made visible, to be made specifically, uh, if you like, reified within the practices of law, government, allocation the health service, the education service, the police service. So this tension between making visible and making invisible actually runs through how we think about the rights to the city. Now, the term itself comes out of Lefebvre, as most people here will, will know. And Lefebvre has, a, I think, a beautiful prose style and a romantic notion of les événements and the, the kind of freedoms of the city, but also a, uh, a certain kind of lack of detail when it comes to the, the specifics of how you think about the accommodation of the newly arrived in the machine, the machine of the city. And the point I'm I want to make is, is that uh, it is possible to begin to use the city as a way of thinking about the practices of allocation of scarce resources, the regulation of populations, uh, which in various ways materialize migration. What I mean, as I say, this is kind of theory-like, but, but the, 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 what I'm hinting at, I just want to, uh, if you like, just invoke certain traditions of, of thinking about the city. Uh, I, I want to end up trying to suggest that we, that we need to go um, through, uh, 
my one-liner would be, if you like, through some of the dilemmas of the post-structuralism uh, that has thought through uh, the dynamics of race and migration in the city, but uh, beyond that to what somebody who was here, Nigel Thrift, uh, talks about as a non-representational theory. And I'm not going to talk about any of that. But what I do want to at least signal is, is that, that there is a tradition of thinking through the city, of thinking about the city, of talking about the city, that actually privileges a certain kind of understanding of migration at its heart. From Zimmel, whose work, uh, late 19th century work, was incredibly uh, important in influencing all sorts of people that, that we could talk about. There was the notion, if you remember, that the, the arrival in the city uh, was fundamentally important to an understanding of, of modernity. In fact, for Zimmel, people will know that rationality itself was precisely derived, defined by the editing out of certain kinds of excess that you find in the sensorium of, of, of the city. So the, the rational is socially constructed to make sense of the, the urban experience. And in that process of uh, editing, he begins to think about the importance of the city as a space of freedom, a space in which some things can be hidden and some things can be made visible. And so, as I say, just, I'm not going to go into this, but what that, that points us towards is, is, if you like, some of the critical sociological investigation that came out of a certain German tradition, particularly identified with scholars like Adorno, Benjamin, Max Horkheimer, and more seriously, again, in some of their students, uh, or lovers in one case, uh, Heidegger and Arendt, and how they began to think about the generation of the public sphere, the public realm of the city, through both the privileging of uh, anonymity and the privileging of, of visibility. And the writers I'm interested in, in the contemporary uh, people like, if you want to understand East London, you should read Satanic Verses, which is an amazing book, I think. But people like Sennett, who himself was a student of uh, Arendt at one stage, who has, again, talked to and spoken to the importance of, if you like, the freedom of the city, but the city as a space of disguise, as a space of anonymity, as a space in which um, the, the city defies governing, it defies control, it defies knowing. So I'm not going to talk about that anymore, but that's just to kind of signal those things I'm interested in. What I, instead I want to talk about is just three examples of what I want to talk about as entanglement, because the point I'm trying to make is that if we begin to take seriously the city as a political machine, a machine through which resources are allocated, through which chances are uh, defined, through which futures are made uh, calculable, then we, we might want to understand how that machine accommodates or doesn't accommodate migrations. And the three examples I just want to give are the kind of, the kind of thinking, uh, I'm, I'm, say, I'm, I'm, I might jump one or, two, one or two of these, I'm afraid, and just kind of bring, it, bring the talk to an end in time. The first case is around housing, ne housing needs. And very, sorry, these illustrations, I'm not quite sure whether I like these illustrations or not, but they come from a, a show that's in the, you can see in the Museum of London at the moment called Postcards from the Future, about this is, London of, this is a London of climate change, which has attracted some publicity in the press, mm -hmm. because uh, London becomes the site of massive environmental migra this, migration. The, the, in the, the illustrations, you see the, the gherkin becomes squatted by migrants. Uh, there is shanty towns outside Trafalgar Square and Buckingham Palace. Um, anyway, the point of the, 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 the examples I want to give, the entanglements I want to give, the, 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 are threefold. If, if you look at what happens in the late 1970s across the, the UK, the big migrations that have responded to the economic growth of the uh, 1950s and 1960s generates a flow of labour across the world from the old colonies into various cities, but including, including London, but a failure to address the housing need. What then happens is a series of campaigns emerge around people's right to be housed, partly. Now, there's no time to go into to the kind of many, many histories of those struggles to find somewhere to be housed. But what, what to cut a long story short, um, comes through in one part of East London that we'll come back to, uh, Tam, that's the East End itself, is that uh, through the association of a number of intellectuals from Bangladesh, of young people looking for somewhere to live, of people who've 
moved to work in the sweatshops and the growing number of curry houses in, in East London, uh, people need somewhere to live. There is at the same time many places that are empty and the squatting movement becomes quite significant very quickly to kind of run through uh, several years of, of history. That squatting movement becomes increasingly uh, switched from a position where it is seen as illegal and challenging uh, to a position where a number of organisations emerge from the squatting movement that um, produce uh, housing associations that gain control of some of those squatted properties. So Spitalfields Housing Association, Labo Housing Association, Mitali Housing Association in the late 1970s and 1980s become recognised as forms of uh, provision of settlement, provision of somewhere to live. In other words, the rights of the, the city, if you like, are contested by the social movement, almost kind of Castells-like fa uh, fashion. But what also happens more recently in the last few years is some of the self-same activists who were involved in that period see that that moment of separation, that moment of provision of housing specifically for Bangladeshi migrants is potentially producing something um, antithetical to their ethical goals, if you like. And in uh, situations of fairly contested uh, uh, politics, if you like, there is both a recognition of something called black and minority ethnic housing needs in the late 1980s and early 1990s. But in the early 2000s, the main funders of these housing associations begin to kind of query whether it's right to have these housing associations. And there is a diminution of their size, scope, scale. The point being that the category, the need category of the migrant emerges and disappears over time. But in doing so, what it reveals is, if you like, the workings of the market itself, the workings of the housing market. In, I'm going to jump to China just for a second and again um, to, to try to wrap up with a couple, couple more examples because you might think that there, there are no ob obvious parallels, but when you actually look at the, the floating population in cities like Shenzhen. I'll jump, I'll jump the numbers because the point, Shenzhen itself is fascinating, not least because if anyone's been there, it has these extraordinary concentrations that are known as the Chongjongsuen, the villages in the city, uh, levels of uh, residential density that are allegedly greater than anywhere else other than contemporary Palestine, where the Woshufang, the handshake apartments, uh, concentrate migrants in housing that is privately owned by clans, kins, folk uh, who trace their origins to old um, rural fishing villages where when they made Shenzhen, the, the old style rural property rights of the villages were left uh, in place while the city grew. And in China, there is a difference between the property rights regimes that work in the city and those that work in the countryside. So you have a regime of property ownership in the villages in the city that is distinct from the regimes of property rights that work in the, the countryside, even though the countryside is at the heart of the city, the heart of the city itself. What emerges in, in these villages in the city are these extraordinarily flexible urban forms that, uh, again, accommodate migrants on a huge scale. In, initially, in these extraordinary places that are seen as in the late 1990s and 2000s as in some ways dysfunctional and the city begins to move towards trying to kind of uh, in some cases trying to, to eradicate these forms of effectively um, uh, rentier uh, class uh, housing of, of migrants. But what I spent a couple of months there with interviewing uh, migrants in 2009 and uh, one of the many things that is striking about this urban form is quite how adaptable it is. And there is a big architectural discourse around the, the kind of, that has begun to celebrate the Chongjun Swen with um, quite big name ar architects like uh, Martin Jung and Urbanus, uh, who uh, Martin Jung worked with Rem Koolhaas on a number of projects. But uh, uh, the, a number of architects have begun to celebrate these, these villages in, in the city in, in certain uh, uh, academic debates in mainstream architecture precisely for their flexibility, if you like. What emerges, the point of the story I want to make, it's kind of cut to the chase, that you, people want to talk a little bit more about it, is, is twofold. One is that these, they become uh, 
very flexible urban forms functionally. So that in places near the Hong Kong border, as the border opens up between Hong Kong and Shenzhen, you get a lot of kind of um, very rapid semi-gentrification of the, these spaces that accommodate the, the upscaling of the Shenzhen uh, labor force. In the area around uh, Dafen, in one example, you get a specialization of the painting, oil painting, uh, where you get thousands of people producing oil paints, oil painting for across the world. In, in the area of um, one of the Chongzhenswen, there was, uh, a, again, a, a R&D development from an electronic company that began to locate its workforce in the Chongzhenswen itself. So they produce very rapid changes in the accommodation of skilled migrants. Of course, what also takes place is at moments of, of demolition, in the, uh, the, the moment of change crystallizes a fight around who can be moved and who can't be moved from, uh, from these forms of settlement, forms of accommodation. And the point I would want to, to make is, is that what is revealed in both these cases, in the case of the, if you like, the, ha the, the history of migrant housing social movements in uh, London and in the history of the, the Chongzhen Swim, it is that the integration of migrants uh, that is or is not functional to, to the uh, economy begins to reveal certain uh, norms and forms and developments within the system of the city itself, within the forms of uh, <coughs> law through which uh, the rights of the, the nail households, as they're known in China. Uh, this picture on the bottom left of your screen uh, is quite famous. People will probably have seen it. One of the kind of nail houses where people just refuse to move in the... In the uh, when being threatened with, with the big-scale demolition in the cities. And there is a kind of extraordinary power to some of these forms of resistance, actually, from the nail households that begin to uh, open up a space in the city for certain kinds of uh, debate about how you accommodate new, new populations, which slightly counter some of the caricatures that you might find in some of the literatures around um, China and East Urbanism. I'm going I'm to skip barking and just... Uh, because Barking is actually quite an interesting place where the BMP have become particularly significant in the most recent times. But just touch on a final case, which I haven't time to go into a huge amount of detail around, but where in a third of these entanglements, as I, I want to call them, th th there is a uh, daycare centre, which emerges in the last three or four years uh, in, actually, no, quite slightly longer than that, about four or five years, the Sonali Gardens Daycare Centre. It is a health resource. Now, part and parcel of the work that we're trying to do for the Future of Cities programme is look at the ways in which uh, migrants either do or do not get access to, if you like, the, the political economies of, of health itself. And, and what the, the, the simple two, three-liner story of this daycare centre is that in the east end of London, as migrants grow old, the category that recognises the elderly, uh, the, the, the rights of the elderly to find a place within the welfare state uh, is increasingly changing across all demographic groups. Right? And so how you think about ageing, Sarah was here last, last week, how you think about the interface of ageing and migration is, is quite problematic in all sorts of ways. But in terms of a politics of recognition, in the East End of London in the late 1990s, early 2000s, you found a... Um, proliferation of daycare centres for the elderly that had at their heart a notion of the elderly that was, if you like, a certain version of a white East End of London resident that had certain kinds of provision, certain kinds of parties, certain kinds of norms and forms of everyday life that was pretty much alien to the, the sorts of needs from a growing Bangladeshi population. What emerges is a, a, a debate. The point uh, I want to make, uh, I suppose, is that we, uh, as leader of the, um, the council, when we put together the first Bangladeshi daycare centre, which had provision of prayer facilities, it had provision of um, various other, it had provision of halal food, it had provision of other forms of if you like, cultural needs. But, but two or three things happened. One was this became quite controversial, that David Davis, the um, uh, then uh, uh, shadow uh, secretary of state, uh, Home, sorry, shadow Home Secretary actually condemned the development 
and suggested that it was promoting segregation rather than integration. And this led to a kind of a, a, a front page of a national tabloid that suggested this development should not take place. Subsequently also, how you define the needs group of the elderly became defined as Islamic rather than Bangladeshi, an inflection which again began to trigger different associations for different, different people. The subject began to change, but also maybe most controversially uh, for some people, the way we actually made the deal stack up was by working with um, a combination of developers and a third sector organization, a housing association, to do a deal on a piece of real estate that was extremely valuable, to build on one piece of the real estate and sell it off for private money, uh, arguably gentrifying that part of the borough. The money that was generated by the, the cash return on the real estate deal actually paid for the development of what is actually was the best daycare centre in the country at the time. Uh, and it, it was then provided for the needs of Bangladeshi community. The point I'm trying to make is you get simultaneously the interface of planning, the planning regimes by which in the, the regulation of real estate sales you deliver certain kinds of value capture that deliver forms of the welfare state, that deliver in turn forms of eligibility that do or do not recognize the rights of migrants. You get, if you like, this kind of material assemblage of rights and regulations and rules that makes something possible, I would still define as a social good, but it is a complex hybrid form. It is not just an anonymous city that either accommodates or doesn't accommodate. It is not the integration machine straightforwardly of the city. It is, a, if you like, this complex mix of rights, association, identity and citizenship and political economy and land value. In fact, what I, what I would say in conclusion, really just to wrap up very straightforwardly, is, is that we need to think slightly differently about the relationship between the networks of people and the networks of property values that are at the heart of processes of urban change when we're trying to make sense of uh, the different scales of the national, the neighborhood and the, the continental when trying to understand the accommodation of, of migrants in these forms of what's sometimes talked about as, as scale jumping, if you like. The, the, the settlement of new demographics in the cities of the 21st century become immediately implicated in the forms of political economy, the forms of uh, employment and residence that are regulated, are governed, are ruled by the local state, but also uh, are implicated in forms of land value that make an understanding of these things simultaneously Im imperative. The examples I, I tried to give, the, that, that moment of, if you like, the rights of the, uh, the floating population, the migrants of China in the cities of the 21st century, and the rights of the new migrants from Eastern Europe, or the migrants who've been in, settled from Bangladesh over 30, 40 years ago in the welfare state of the 21st century. In each of these cases, what is revealed, if you like, is the forms of uh, real estate valuation, the forms and norms of state government, state rule that actually mark the polis of the city. And so that, I think, is the point I would uh, try and argue, is that, that the migration works as a bit like, uh, the, just to wrap up completely, the bit like uh, a hero of mine was, was Garfinkel. As you may know, Garfinkel was a uh, academic in the on, the on the west coast towards the end of his life anyway who who used to say that you find out rules by you find out rules by breaking them and he, so he uses a form of social psychology whereby he got his students to go along to academic dinners and try and tip the the dean's wife and uh, one, one unfortunate incident but the point I try and make is, is that the city is, is is something similar that you understand the codes, the keys, the way, the dynamics of the city works mm -hmm. by the moments at which the rules, the organization and its, its politics are, are challenged. The moment of challenge, the moment of change is the moment at which the structure of power, the structure of rules, the structure of regulation, the structure of the market becomes visible.
and understanding the, the, the dynamic of migration and the city for the 21st century, I think, helps us do that. Thank you. Thank you.